Okay, well, we are in Acts chapter 25 this morning. But we're going to start off with a little Devo. Um, For those of you that were here Wednesday night, we just spent a little bit of time in Psalm 23. Uh, So I'm calling this what I think or I hope I've learned this week. Because you never know which applies. Um, James 1 verse 2 says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And 1 Peter 1 6 says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. And I was thinking about, we have a lot of sayings in life, both in Christianity and just human existence. And and one, for example, is that when you get older, don't you say to yourself, uh, if I only knew then what I know now, I would do things differently? Maybe, (laughs) you know, sometimes, you know, but there are some occasions where, um, you know, that wouldn't really help. For example, acne, okay? When I was a teen, I didn't want that bulbous nose, you know, or the North Star, you know, and um, I would go to town with, uh, what were they, Stridex medicated pads? I don't know if they still make those or not. And uh, you think, okay, what would I do differently now? Well, now that I'm older, I might get a pimple like in my ear (laughs) or in my nose. So knowledge really is not helping me in either of those situations, you know. But I was thinking about trials uh, this week. And of course, in the text, we're looking at the continual trial, literally and spiritually, of the Apostle Paul. But I was thinking about, um, ever watch kids when they first learn to walk? I had the privilege of being able to um, teach my sister how to walk and my, and my daughter. And um, it's funny just to look at their faces, you know. When they first start walking, it's kind of like there's this glow, there's this excitement. It's like, I'm doing this, you know. I'm, I'm walking. I can, I can do this, you know. And then they fall down. But the excitement of being able to walk is they get right back up, you know. They're like, I can do this. I can, I can do this. I can walk, you know. And, and I think in a lot of ways, trials are like that, you know. Because in trials, somebody said this. I don't know who, Greg Laurie, I think, gets credit for this. But he said, trials make you bitter or better. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I understand that. I understand what he's saying is a blanket statement. But let's think about reality, like everyday life. What trials do is they make you bitter, better, and you're happy, or they make you bitter and um, not better and worse, you know? And, And it tends not to be black and white, okay? Because you get better for a while, And then somehow, because just the word, right? Just the word, the nature of trial is that it's a a long process, right? It's a trial. And you end up sometimes you sound like Eeyore, you know? But what happens, okay, as you walk with the Lord is just like that kid that's learning how to walk, um, he or she um, is so excited by being able to walk that they get right back up, you know, and they're walking, you know, and yeah, maybe it hurt, and maybe there were obstacles in the path, but the joy, the experience of being able to walk overrides the bumping, the pain, and, you know, things that get in the way, like a possession, like if you have it, I want it, if I had it and gave it to you, it's mine, you know, those kind of things. So, you know, I've come to the point uh, where I really don't care for the black and white thinking but um, I'm more interested in um, winning, overcoming. In fact, I'm more interested in being able to walk with Jesus in that trial. And I'll tell you why, okay? The great thing, if you look around this room, is that when you're in a trial, just like when that kid falls on the ground, you have the opportunity for somebody else in this room to reach out a hand and help pick you up right? Remember uh, when we looked at uh, Peter and John, and they're going to the temple to pray in the book of Acts, and there was that guy who had been begging his whole life, never been able to walk, okay? And so he's, you know, money for the poor, whatever he said, you know, and then Peter's like, silver and gold I have not, but what I do have, I give to you in Christ Jesus, rise up and walk, and he put out his hand, and that guy was not only able to walk, the guy's jumping up and down, you know, he's like the little baby going, whoo! I can walk, right? Okay, here's the rub, though. 
When you and I are going through a trial, we don't have to ask for that hand. We can continue just to kind of stumble and bump into things and say, oh, I've got another trial. And you just continue on like Eeyore, okay? But if we will go to other brothers and other sisters, and especially to the Lord, and especially to his word, we have the ability to get that hand to reach out. Now, what gets hard is that sometimes over time, sometimes we don't even want to get up. We just want to stay there on the ground. And then what ends up happening to us as a body is we see this person on the ground and they're not even going to put their hand up and we're thinking, how can we help that person? When the truth of the matter is, if I don't reach out my hand to help you get up, then I'm probably thinking about me, right? And that's overrated. Amen? I better get an amen because I can think about me all the live long day. But what ends up happening, and we don't like this because we don't like to ask for help. We don't want to appear needy. We don't want to look vulnerable. We don't want other people to think, okay, here comes the person that needs help. But we're actually blessing that person by asking for their help. And they actually get to, and here's, here's the great part, they actually get to function within their gifting in the body because we all have gifts. At least one, if not more than that. If we don't use it, well, then we can, we can continue, we can sit down, you know, and, and go through that. So, um, yeah. So, let's go back to Acts 25, right? That's where we're supposed to be. And we will pray, because without prayer, what did MC Hammer say? We can't make it today, so let's pray. Father, thank you that your Holy Spirit gets to teach us so that we get to hear from you. Lord God, it's not about Calvary Chapel. You know, it's not about verse-by-verse teaching. Lord God, as we're praying, Lord, help us to continue to pray so that your word guides us, directs us, and empowers us to live a life that is so well-pleasing to you, and that's a life of faith. We just pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts 25. Where we've been is that Paul has been on trial, and he's had to deal with a guy named Felix, and he's getting ready to in- be introduced to a new governor named Festus. And you can get all your gun smoke, uh, you know, thinking out of your mind at this point. This is a much different Festus. But before we jump into there, I want to read to you um, an interesting story, not that much different from Pastor Saeed. Uh, in the more early morning hours of October 4th, 1980, a young nursing student was brutally murdered in the Chicago suburb of Oak Park. Following the advice of well-meaning friends, Steve Linscott, a student at Emmaus Bible College, told police about a dream he'd had the night of the crime. Oak Park police later arrested him, interpreting his dream account as the roundabout confession of a psychopathic killer. Later, a jury found Lynn Scott guilty, and he was sentenced to 40 years in prison. But there's just one problem. Lynn Scott was innocent. So only after time in prison and numerous legal appeals, a process that lasted 12 years, was Lynn Scott freed and vindicated. So what was that like? What, What could that have been like? Those years undoubtedly brought the most difficult challenges that he would ever face because he's separated from his wife, he's separated from his kids, except for brief visits. And here's the point, if you could listen with me this morning. He's wondering if he had somehow brought all of this on himself and why did God allow this to happen? Which is such a frequent question that we encounter both among ourselves as well as to other people. But he was able to survive the prison violence. Okay, those were tough years, but they were years of growth and growing. So he was able to get through better, not bitter, right? Thank you, Greg Laurie. And uh, most of all, and here's the part that just blows me away, is that he came about with a greater awareness of the goodness of God. Because it would be real easy to say, God, how could you allow this to happen, right? So his words, he says, I have come to realize Gosh, this is, this is heavy. I've come to realize that we cannot judge God's purposes, nor where he places us, nor why he chooses one path for our lives as opposed to another. And this is a person who is able to have been brought out of the trial and freed. That's amazing. Okay? 
So the Bible itself is replete with accounts of divine action or inaction that doesn't seem fair. Who are examples we could think of that in the Bible? Who's that? Joseph, right? Job. Job? Joseph? It's a bummer to be named J in the Bible, right? Okay. Daniel? He had a tough gig, right? And yet God, and we were talking about this one day, I don't know who said this, maybe it was Bruce in prayer, but God's working out the big picture, okay? Usually in Christ, we have a good beginning, okay? And we're trusting him for the end, so we're kind of stuck in the middle, right? The other day, Malcolm in the Middle was on, not necessarily advocating that show, but there's this scene with Dewey. He's in the back seat and those girls driving him, or well, this woman's driving him in the car, and she hadn't smoked for 20 years until Dewey got in the car. <laughs> and what ended up happening is he's in the back seat of the car going, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, and eventually she smoked. So <laughs> know this today, God can help us through the A, B, C, Ds of our life, and he's going to do that for Paul, but he's in process, and he's in the middle headed towards the end of his life, okay? So sometimes uh, we go through things and it doesn't make sense except when viewed in light of God's perfect plan. Psalm 94, 22 says, <laughs> I love this, but the Lord has been my defense and my rock and my refuge. And my wife and I had to learn Psalm 91 when we were first married because we didn't have a car, and so sometimes if she was walking home uh, from work at night or whatever, you know, we had to be able to say, I will say unto the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust. And it's interesting how knowing that she knew the word of God made me feel better as a husband when there were times that I couldn't be there walking with her. Paul is going to continue to provide us with real life illustrations on how to respond when we're falsely accused in this life in our Christian walk. Now he's already shown his humanity and I love that. We need that, okay? If everybody in the Bible is perfect, we're sunk. Okay, we're just done, you know? We're just, I mean, thank God for Jesus as the perfect life, but we need people that had humanity. And so remember there was the guy that smacked Paul in the mouth and what did he call him? You're a whitewashed tomb. <laughs> you know? You're full of dead men's bones, okay? Now, you know, I don't know how I would react when I, get, uh, when I get struck, but, you know, sometimes we're in battle with our mouths, right? And so God is there. He's able to provide. Sometimes we find out what we should have done after we did the wrong thing, but, you know, uh, we're not dealing with a perfect person. But, again, Paul does provide a stellar example of what to do in the midst of dire circumstances, especially when somebody's been falsely charged. Because when we have been wrongly accused of something, what bubbles up? Pride. Oh, I remember in English class, first studying pride. It's like this green beast with multiple heads, right? You can't do that to me, you know? But... In your quiet time, and that's, I think that's what blesses our teaching, our devotional time, okay? In our quiet time, God says, you know what? I can handle your prideful situation. So give that person to me. In fact, Chuck, you make a lousy Holy Spirit. So do you, Rick. So do you, Jenna, right? Let the Holy Spirit do the convicting work, and you respond in being con connected to me, and I'll get you through that situation, even when the pride comes up. So Paul is going to change the taste of being falsely accused from bitter to better. So Paul appeals to Caesar is the heading over chapter 25. So we're going to continue now in verse 1 of Acts 25, and we're going to look at a, a guy named Festus. So now when Festus had come to the province after three days, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. So we've got a change in the governorship of Judea, uh, southern Syria and Jerusalem. A guy named Felix has been uh, recalled to Rome because of his cruelty to the Jews, and we read about that in chapter 24. Uh, it was only because of his brother's uh, Paulus influence that he was actually able to be a governor, but he actually... Uh, tells us that he was able to have his life spared, but tradition says he was banished and then he committed suicide. So we've got a new guy here 
Porcius Festus. I just can't. Can you imagine naming a kid Porcius? Oh, look, there's a little Porcius. I don't see that happening, but they did. So, new man Porcius replaced him. History tells us he was a gracious man. Uh, but when he took over, he took over a difficult situation because you get that tension with the Jews. Okay, it's near the breaking point. Only days after his arrival in Caesarea, um, he's going to travel to meet with Jewish leaders in Jerusalem in, in verse 1 that we just read. So we're going to see how he tries to earn the favor of the Jews. Isn't it hard at times to earn the favor of everybody? To be a people pleaser? How's that go for you? How'd that go this week? It's hard to do, right? Now the way to do it is to please him. And, and that's for me, it's for Pat, it's for everybody in this room, okay? Because isn't it interesting how you get power and when you're pleasing him, then you're able to get through the people in your life that you can't please. Because I guarantee you, especially if you're a voice for Christ, you will not be able to please everybody, okay? So here's a guy in a governing position um, who's got a problematic situation with Paul the Apostle in the picture. So he's inherited southern Judea, Jerusalem, which was not the best duty in the world, okay? Okay. But apparently he's an energetic guy. Notice in verse 1, in other words, this guy is so interested in administering the province well that instead of hanging out at Caesarea very long, he says, oh, I got to go up to the most important city of my province. I got to go to Jerusalem. So he goes there to check things out. Verse 2, then the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul and they petitioned him. So this is interesting. Paul was on trial for being accused of speaking blasphemies against the temple, uh, trying to destroy Judaism, preaching heresy, on and on. I don't know, you would have thought that maybe the religious leader said, you know, at this point, two years have gone by. It's kind of a long time to hold on to a grudge, isn't it? I don't know, I would have thought, you know what? The guy's in jail, you know, let him go. I'm not going to sing the Frozen song, by the way. Um, but they should let it go. But they have a forgiveness problem. And I remember Pastor Pat sharing with me early on uh, when he came here from Elsinore about a root of bitterness, okay, in Hebrews. For some of us here this morning, okay, there is without a doubt people in our lives that we have a problem with and we need to let go of, okay? And the way to do that again is to realize that we are not their Holy Spirits, Okay, now it's easy to say that, easy to read it on these notes, much harder to, to go out there and do it. And that's why in the course of a day, that's why things are not so black and white, just bitter or better. There's a lot of things in between bitter and better, right? Okay, so um, in order to do that, you go to God. I gotta be honest with you, I think sometimes you just go to God and say, God, help. <laughs> what do I do? What do I do with this situation or with these people or with the circumstance? And, and then listen. Okay, so two years is a long time for somebody else to control us, somebody else to get into our thoughts. You can be having a happy time, you can be having time with your family or whatever, and then all of a sudden, they're there, something reminds you, and they've taken over, and it's, it's, it's a crime, okay? So for some of us, we've been wronged. Maybe we had a part to play. Regardless, it hurts us to hold on to unforgiveness, doesn't it? And I'm speaking from experience. So these religious leaders didn't know um, that Satan is actually using them to try and thwart the purposes of God. Verse 3. So asking a favor against him that he, uh, Festus, would summon him, Paul, to Jerusalem <laughs> while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. Okay. Religious leaders plotting a murderous ambush of a guy who's preaching a different religious perspective. At some point, if my religion is causing me to lie and to set up murder scenarios, I'm in the wrong religion or I'm not right with my religion. Amen? Okay. Don't let me preach alone. This was all a ruse, okay? It was just a plot to kill him. And they knew, <laughs> they knew that Paul would be acquitted in a fair trial because they didn't have any evidence, okay? What did he do to desecrate the temple? Nothing, okay? 
they tried to create, in fact, they created false accusations that he was bringing Gentiles, okay, into the temple. He wasn't doing that. So the plan for him to get ambushed, to get murdered before any trial could take place. Um, once again, if your religion causes you to lie and murder, get a new religion or repent. Okay, so this shows how dangerous, now this is, this is the part that is really, really true. This is how dangerous it is when religion is dis disconnected from Jesus Christ because he's the way, the truth, and the life, okay? So, in the sense of it here, in the verse we just read, is that they kept bugging him about Paul over and over, incessant, okay? They're reforming this plot, which is thickening. They realize that this guy, Festus, is ignorant of local culture. We're going to find out he doesn't even know who Jesus is, okay? So, they're going to take advantage of that, the enemies of Christ, okay? So, they're saying, look, if you want our favor, hey, just bring Paul to Jerusalem, and uh, we see Satan working behind the scenes. You know what he want, you know what Satan wants to do with Paul? He wants to stop his mouth. That's how powerful the gospel is. The, we know from history this guy was kind of like a short guy with a unibrow. Makes me think of the 80s. I don't know why. But, you know, big fuzzy brow, you know. Um, poor eyesight, watery eyes crooked, no, or, you know, bow-legged. He wasn't a looker, and apparently from 1 Corinthians 1, he wasn't a, you know, a great speaker. <laughs> but he had the courage to speak the truth to people, and that's dangerous. But isn't it worth it to everybody that we get to share with, okay? So they obviously didn't have much of a case against him. He's been sitting in a cell for two years, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, he may have known that Felix kept him under house arrest because he was hoping for a bribe. You know, I don't know. But verse 4 says, Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly. So Porcius Festus succeeded Felix. Uh, we find that out uh, from Josephus, the Jewish historian. And... Um, so he gave Festus the uh, procuratorship of Judea in AD 60. It's just fun to say, rolls off the tongue. Um, this guy's going to die in two years. So um, he was considered better than Felix and then better than the guy who's coming, Albinus, the next governor. Uh, but this guy's a secular man. He's a Roman. Um, he's a soldier who really doesn't care about spiritual things, but he's a good ruler. And he's going to hear Paul, he's going to get bugged by him, and he has a strong reaction. Does he know about the plot? Uh, the Jews plot to murder Paul along the road? Or did the governor have some other reason for his decision? We don't know. Okay, the Bible doesn't tell us. What we do know, and I hope we all know here this morning, is that God was in control. God was in control and was continuing to protect his servant. Think, remember the 470 soldiers that surrounded him as, as he traveled, okay? So no matter how many devious men may, there may be, the Lord of heaven is not fooled. And I'm so glad, because we get fooled. You know, sometimes we think we're wrestling with flesh and blood. We're not, okay? We're dealing with spiritual issues day-to-day -day in our day-to-day -day living. Uh, you know, years later, the Roman Empire will end Paul's earthly life, but only because it was God's will, okay? The sovereign God is always in control. I need to know that, don't you? He's always in control. So it's not, it's not Washington, thank God. Whew. It's not presidential candidates, whether or not they choose to debate, okay? It's none of those things, okay? So Paul was not only the one of God's workers to be, well, he was not the only one of God's workers to be falsely accused. And we've, we've talked about Joseph, uh, one of the very few people in the Bible uh, where there's arguably nothing negative written about him. It's pretty impressive. Um, a man who knew what it was like to be betrayed, <laughs> to be betrayed and hated and slandered, sold into slavery by jealous brothers, accused of a crime he didn't commit, imprisoned and even forgotten by a fellow prisoner he had helped. Joe could have become bitter toward man and God. Instead, kept a heavenly focus Again, sometimes if you can't keep a heavenly focus, get a hold of somebody in this room. Get a hold of another brother or sister, okay? It's how we help. 
So he says in Genesis 50, 20, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. I don't know. What do you think it was like for Joseph in prison? Do you think he was doing the slash mark thing day after day after day after day? Because that would have been a lot of slash marks. Don't know. Do you think he gave up worrying about how long he had been there? Don't know. Do you think he gave up hoping the cupbearer was going to keep his promise? Don't know. How long can a person hold on to a dusty promise? As long as he hangs on to Jesus Christ for dear life. That's how long. That is Paul's secret. Now, we won't get to chapter 26 this morning, but I do love 26.1, I believe, where Paul says to King Agrippa, I think myself happy. I remember at the first church I went to, which was a little more charismatic than we are, <laughs> I remember the pastor going, I think myself happy, you know? He was very animated, and there are just some verses that stand out to you because of that emphasis. But as Paul put it, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Paul died a long time ago before he ever got into prison and before he ever got martyred because he could die to himself. And the only way that men and women and young people can do that today is to be connected with, with the Father. Consider William Tyndale. He actually dared to translate the Bible into English. How crazy. Or the Ten Boom family. Remember, they dared to hide Jews rather than let the Nazis take him away to concentration camps. To defy the authority of man in order to obey God is, in the eyes of human government, improper. But God is honored, God is pleased for such obedience to him. In the words of the great reformer John Calvin, Christ's servants must be all the more courageous to carry on through good and evil reports. And they should not think it anything remarkable that evil is spoken of them when they have done good. At the same time, they must easily defend themselves before men when the opportunity arises. You know what Paul was hoping for? Just the moment where he could preach the gospel again. The guy had gotten beaten up. He's on the steps of the Antonio Fortress. <laughs> and I could just imagine, you know, one eye probably half shut, you know, kind of like one of these numbers and talking to the guard. Let me preach the gospel one more time. I thought you were an Egyptian. No, I'm Hebrew. Let me do it one more time. Because he was a changed man. And that happens on the inside. I love that song, Inside Out, because that's where the change is. A lot of times you first get saved and well, you, maybe you quit drinking and smoking pot and whatever else that we used to do, take down a police station with a buck knife. But it has to happen on the inside because God says, Chuck, <laughs> Rick, I want your heart. That's what I want for Valentine's Day and every other 364 day out of the year. I want your heart. That's the hardest thing to give them because as Christians, we give people our hearts and then there's the risk that they can hurt us. And they will, and they do, and they have. The good news is, is that he doesn't, he hasn't, and he won't. Okay? So, how do God's servants not only survive but thrive in such straits? Daniel was taken up out of the den. No kind of harm was found on him. I wonder what lion breath is like. You ever thought about that? I don't know. Steve Gard? Okay. But uh, the reason why is that Daniel 6.23 says he trusted in his God, sending him for faith. He's able to take his extreme life circumstances and say, God, you're going to get me out of this or you're going to sustain me through this. So for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world Our faith. 1 John 5, 4. The false accusations of men and women, though they hurt us, and it, I know we have a lot of John Wayne guys that come to our church, but the truth of the matter is, sometimes sticks and stones, yeah, words do hurt, okay? Because we are a product of words spoken in our lives, right? That's how we think of ourselves, okay? But 
from those we love, they can do no ultimate harm. Okay? And how do you know the people that love you? Because they take the time to invest in you. You can tell the difference between flattery and somebody really cares about you, right? We, you know that. That's, that's a part of becoming like an adult. You know, somebody says something flattering, you're like, that's fine, but it's not true. <laughs> you know, and, and you move on. But when somebody really cares, they look into you and they're able, sometimes they even share what God is trying to communicate to you at that time, okay? So we really only require God's approval and acceptance. And if Jesus Christ is our Savior, we've got it. Don't take my word for it. Romans 8, 1. All right? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. How do we get God's approval and acceptance? Well, if you've claimed the name of Christ, Ephesians 1, 5 says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, he made us accepted in the beloved. He did it. You didn't do it. I didn't do it. Marty didn't do it. He did it. And that's good news. If I do it, if I made myself accepted, then I have the ability to lose my salvation, right? That's not good news. <laughs> I better get an amen. Okay. Amen? Thank you. All right. Verse 5. Therefore, he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there's any fault in him. So he says, look, bring witnesses to Caesarea so I can hear the case. Verse 6. When he remained among them more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. If you can imagine this scene in your mind, you're running the movie, you've got Festus as governor, and he's sitting on a judgment seat. Now, I don't know exactly the dimensions of it, but it's above Paul, okay? It's an elevated platform. In the ancient Greek language, it's known as the bima seat, judgment seat, right? But it's an elevated seat of judgment, and it was elevated to illustrate the fact that I am over you. I'm sitting in judgment of you. I have the power or the authority to determine your case one way or another, okay? Not the Blondie song, okay? So the truth is that you and I will stand before Jesus Christ on his judgment seat, but it's not about going to heaven or hell, He's going to look at the works that we've done. He's going to look at the motives for what we've done, why we've done it, okay? So really, everything we do in this life matters. And I tell you what, if you read that and you're going to teach that, it'll affect the way that you live. <laughs> I guarantee it. <laughs> this weekend, I'm like, can't do that. <laughs> Got to teach that, okay? So just because we're not saved by works doesn't mean that our moral life doesn't matter. It does. And we are going to have to stand one day and give an account. And that's why sometimes what we do, as much fun as we have and as much joy as we have, there are times we have to be serious about what we're studying according to the Word of God, okay? And for you and I, if you believe in His Son and what He did for you, then that was settled at the cross, right? That is a done deal. But He will assess the life that you and I have lived. Verse 7. When he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, <laughs> which they couldn't prove. And this sounds very familiar because two years ago, the same thing happened in the same place with Felix. So he just left Paul in prison. The Jews want to kill this guy. And then when the Jewish spokesman came to Caesarea to testify against Paul, apparently they didn't have much to say. So Times of malicious accusation and mistreatment are opportunities for prayer and trust in God. C.H. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, Often the less we say to our foes, <laughs> Thank you, Spurgeon, now, okay? <laughs> the less we say to our foes, and the more we say to our best friend, the better it will fare for us. I would have hated to have been Spurgeon's wife. That's all I'm saying, you know? What do you say in an argument with Spurgeon? Take out the trash, you know? You just take out the, I don't know what you say to him. Verse eight, while he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all. Paul says, look, I'm innocent. This is bogus. Verse nine, but Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, 
Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? Now, Paul had written uh, in Romans 13, 1 through 4, that we are to submit uh, to the powers that be because they are ordained of God. So whoever gets elected, that's only because God allows them to be elected, though it's good to vote. Uh, but Roman law was favorable towards Paul at this point, according to God's plan, uh, as they're moving him not back to Jerusalem, but they're actually going to take him to Rome. And actually, in this point, a Roman judge can't move another court without permission of the one accused. So it's actually illegal for Festus to move Paul back to Jerusalem to be tried unless Paul agrees. Verse 10. So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews, I've done no wrong, as you very well know. So Paul's decision right here sets the stage for the rest of the book. And it is going to bring him before Caesar Nero, and you've heard about him who's in power. Verse 11. For I am an offender, or have committed, I'm sorry, for if I am an offender, or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men can accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. So, because Paul is a Roman citizen, Festus says, I have to ask him, okay? Um, again, Festus is extremely ignorant of the history of this case. Paul appeals to see Caesar, which was the right of any Roman citizen. Um, if he had been just under just like a straight judge in a court, believing your trial wasn't fair, then as a Roman citizen, you can go to Caesar. And that was something that Caesar did uh, to make sure that you got a fair trial. And it would be just him and just his opinion that, that, that would count. So um, just think of what God has done through his servants who used that which God made available to them. Uh, William Wilberforce is an example. He was a strong Christian and a member of the British Parliament in the late 18th and 19th centuries, and he championed the abolition of slavery. Exercising spiritual determination, using all the legitimate political resources at his disposal, he persevered in his calling for more than 20 years and was used by God to bring an end to slavery in the British Empire. God working supernaturally in the natural realm. Verse 12. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, You've appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you shall go. You know, again, I said last week, we, we watch courtroom dramas on TV, you know, and you can just imagine this is one of the most dramatic events in the life of the Apostle Paul. He was able to see through the ruse. He saw through the deception and the efforts to get him back to Jerusalem. And he knew he had a much better chance with Caesar than going back to Jerusalem. But it's interesting that it puts him face to face as God's man versus the world's man, who's Caesar. And I love that. Because apparently at this point, Festus wanted to try one more time to use the situation for his own advantage because he's trying to do the Jews a favor, but it's not going to work because he's fighting against God. You lose every time. We all lose every time. So why was Festus suddenly willing to do what he had refused to do earlier to transfer his famous prisoner to Jerusalem? We don't know. But we do know that the governor is being unfair to Paul. There was not enough evidence to even need to send him to Caesar. Uh, and yet, to Festus's credit, he did, he did give Paul a choice. Okay, So he didn't force his situation to go his way. Now we get introduced to a very interesting character named Agrippa, verse 13. And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. Oh, Agrippa and Bernice. An interesting couple, let me tell you. They come to Caesarea. Herod Grip Agrippa is the second. He ruled a client kingdom. A client kingdom... Uh, a Roman client kingdom was a native tribe that chose to align themselves with the Roman Empire because they saw it as the best option for self-preservation or protection from other hostile tribes, okay? The Roman Empire. So it's northeast of Festus's province. Agrippa was known to be an expert in Jewish customs and laws and religious matters. 
He didn't really have jurisdiction over Paul in this case, uh, but Festus thought, hey, here's a man. He's an expert in these things. It would be good for him to hear the matter. Agrippa is an Idumean, so he's part Jew, and he's part Edomite. He's got the title of the appointer, of the high priest, the guardian of the temple. These are all titles that fell to him. He was friends with the imperial family. He had friends in high places. So, low places. Okay, so whatever places. So, this is who we're dealing with. Herod Agrippa. His name was Marcus Julius Agrippa. That's a name, right? Porcius, not so much. Marcus Julius Agrippa. It can be confusing to do a study on the Herod family um, this is the, the last Herod we're going to read about in the New Testament, but it is the legacy of an ent- entire family against God, which is sad. First, there's his great-grandpa. He has all the babies killed in Bethlehem. Yikes. Um, and uh, that guy was married ten times. I was going to make a joke. I won't do that. Okay. I love you guys. Okay. Married ten times. Murdered one of his wives as well as her mother. What was it that saying back then? It was safer to be (laughs) Herod's pig than one of his kids. That's a reputation. Okay, Joan Jett. So his grandpa was Herod Antipas. Whose head did he order? John the Baptist on a platter. That's nasty takeout. That's all I'm saying. That is gross. To be severed from his body. He was the one that Jesus stood before when Pilate commands him uh, to be sent to Herod uh, because he was under Herod's jurisdiction. His father, Agrippa I, had James beheaded and tried to get Peter killed. So I would say this is a pretty dysfunctional family, amen? (laughs) Yeah, so here's the story. So now let's talk about Bernice for a second. She was a, a physically beautiful woman problem was she lived a life jealous of her sister. We read about her last week, chapter 24, the lovely Drusilla. She had been there with Felix. Josephus said that Drusilla excelled all women in beauty. I might add a footnote, exterior beauty. This one, okay, Bernice, is quite a looker herself. She's first married to a prince named Marcus at 13 years old. Yeah, that shouldn't have happened. Then she married her uncle. That shouldn't have happened, who was a Herod, king of Celsius. She left him for her brother, Agrippa. (laughs) Should never happen, the second, whom she's with in this scene and lived in incest. I don't care what anybody says. The Bible is true. (laughs) Nasty at times, but it's true. And so this infuriated the Jews. Uh, She leaves Agrippa for this king, Palamo of Cilicia, goes back to Agrippa uh, in our present place in Acts, living in incest with her brother. She's going to leave him for Vespasian, become his paramour, which is just a weird way of saying mistress for a time. She leaves Vespasian and goes to Tacitus, becoming his wife, leaves him for Titus Vespasian, his son. Premarital counseling, I don't think that happened. Verse 14, when they had been there many days, not to mention marital counseling, don't kill people, don't get raped. Okay, so when they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king saying, there's a certain man left a prisoner by Felix. So Festus, again, he's new to the post, unfamiliar with the facts, trying to get some wisdom, trying to get some insight. He's confused, so he asks Agrippa for advice. Verse 15, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, well, it's not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face, has an opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. So he's like, hey, we do fair trials in Rome. Uh, So now he's going to explain some of the facts. Verse 17. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation of 
him of such things as I supposed. So in other words, he's saying, I was surprised. I thought they had something really good on this guy. Verse 19. But had some questions about him, about their own religion, and about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Notice, first of all, that Festus, a high Roman ruler, a governor, knows practically nothing about Jesus. This is something good for us to remember. We're in in an age where you can get Bibles at Walmart, okay? It doesn't mean that people know about Jesus. They might know, you know, the... They might know the Christmas story, okay, but um, it's good to know. Spurgeon said, brethren, this is why we must keep preaching Jesus Christ because there is still so little known that the masses of this city are as ignorant as Festus was. And it's true. I work with a lady that thought that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were a couple. Happened to have a Bible in my back pocket worked out that day? No, it's not true. This is what the Bible says, okay? We think that people somehow know about Jesus, who he is, what he came to do, and some do. I mean, don't get me wrong, okay? But I believe we have very little estimation about the many that don't. So this is a religious dispute, is what he's saying, about some dead guy. It's claimed to be alive. I don't know what the big deal is. And this guy, Festus, is in a quandary. He needs to send him to Caesar, but he has to substantiate charges as to why he's there in Rome. And the good news is we're almost done. Verse 20. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. I just want to point out that Augustus means it's a term that would actually lead people to believe that Caesar was God and there was Caesar worship going on at this point. So Caesar Augustus establishes it. Uh, Caesar Nero is on the throne. Verse 22, and we'll, we'll finish the chapter. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So so Paul's got to be thinking at this point, I get to speak to a third Gentile ruler. This is pretty cool. Had Felix, Festus, now I get to talk to Caesar. Holy cow. So God is paving the way for Paul to speak and preach the gospel before kings. It's a pretty important privilege. And the meat of what Paul will share with Agrippa, again, is going to be in chapter 26. We're going to read that next week. But as we wrap it up, verse 23, So the next day, when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at Festus's command, Paul was brought in. You know what the Greek word for pomp is? No offense to Disney. It's fantasia. Okay, so it means a vain show of fantasy. So they come into this great auditorium, probably the theater at Caesarea, with great pomp, with royal robes on, uh, or royal robes, no, royal robes on, pomp, pageantry, and it's meant to communicate this is what's important in life. All this fanfare, all this exterior, all this show. If people knew what really was going on behind the scenes, what was going on inside the people's hearts that had all the pomp and all the pageantry, they they would not be celebrating the exterior. In fact, they would be grieved for what was going on inside, right? Okay? So it's screaming out that Agrippa and Bernice are important. Now, it's interesting that we just read there at the very end of verse 23 that Paul is brought in. So he's surrounded by all these important people. He probably has like raggy clothes on. We know later on that he's, uh, he's in chains, okay? But Paul is the one who's important in this scenario. Here's the last verse of the chapter, verse 24. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit, I was wrong, there's more verses, to live any longer. But when I had found out that he had committed nothing deserving of death, 
and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I have brought him out before you and especially before you, King Agrippa, that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. Now, this is the part that just blows me away. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner not to specify the charges against him. Yeah, because it was. It was unreasonable. But, again, Jewish leaders are blinded by sin, right? So Luke points out, interesting, remember that Luke is the human author of the book of Acts, that Paul did nothing deserving of death. So Festus wants to use this trial to actually prepare so he can actually have something to tell Caesar, this is why I'm sending you this guy, because he doesn't have anything. But again, look beyond the pomp, look beyond the pageantry, the show as to what the world says is important. Because Festus refers to Paul as this man. Again, dressed shabbily, in chains. He's in physical chains. Now, spiritually, he's free, right? You're going to know the son. You're going to be free indeed, okay? But based upon appearance, if you were to just look at the people, you would say, well, it's, it's, it's Festus, it's, it's Agrippa, it's Bernice. These are the people that are important. But here's the thing. A few years later, Festus and Agrippa won't even be recognizable in just a few years. But that prisoner is a different matter. He's recognizable today from his words, right? They continue to bless us every day of our lives. And so Festus and Agrippa are footnotes in the story of Jesus and Paul because when this world assigns and gives value, what really matters most of the time is that it gets it, most of the time this world gets it wrong. Sometimes the world can be right in, in that assessment. But again, here's, as we wrap it up, don't be deceived by the pomp, the pageantry. In fact, let God determine what's really important in your lives. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you that we have examples in your word of what to do when things are tough. Lord, we thank you that we have Paul as an example of somebody who was able to persevere. He had a good beginning, um, but he had a good middle, which made